So as we saw in the last video, the last four columns before the right-hand side dictated the solution to our system. And that's how the simplex method works. If you have, so the basic solution, the basic variables have, you know, a one and the rest zero. So all zeros except one, I guess you could say. And then the right-hand side tells you what the value of that variable is. So the goal with the simplex method is to kind of flip it around a little bit. We want x2 to look like that, and we want x1 to look like that, assuming that they're part of the, the optimal solution. So we use the pivot row for three because that's the row that allows us to increase x2 as much as possible without bumping constraints. So our goal is to make the one above it a zero and the 17 below it a zero, and we do so through row operations. So I'm gonna call these rows R1, R2, R3, and R4. So R2 is the pivot, which means it's not gonna change when I write my next matrix. And R3 already has a zero, so that means we don't even need to change R3. So I need to change R1. So here is the pro tip. I wanna combine R2 and R1 to make a new R1. Okay, here's a pro tip. Always, if you have to use negative numbers, do it with the pivot row. Okay, so I have a three and I have a one. So I'm going to take negative R2 and I'm going to add three R1. So just writing those numbers down. So negative R2 would be negative two, negative three, zero, negative one, zero, zero. And just so I have that point of reference, the negative 240. 3R1 is going to be 3, 3, 3, 0, 0, 0, 300. And that means the new R1 is going to have a 1 there, a 0 there, a 3 there, a negative 1 there, two zeros, and a 60. So that's my new replacement row. Okay. And now what we're going to do is also work on R4. So I'm going to combine R2 and R4 in order to make a new R4. So how's that gonna happen? Well, notice I'm combining a positive and a negative, so I don't need to worry about negatives here. Looks like the common denominator between three and 17 is, well, 51. So I'm gonna have to take 17 R2 and add three R4 to get a new R4. So 17 R2 would be, let's see, 17 times two is 34. 17 times three is 51. Then we have zero, then we have 17 then two zeros, then the right-hand side, 17 times 240, I believe, is 4,080. And then 3R4 would be negative 42, uh, negative 51, 0, 0, 0, 3, and 0. So then my new R4 looks like it's going to be, let's see there, negative 8, 0, 0, 17, 0, 3, and 4,080. So that's my new R4. We have successfully gone through one iteration of the simplex method. So now let's write our new table. And for our new table, remember, I am going to write down the column headings because there's just too much to keep track of elsewhere or otherwise. And then we have our right-hand side. So the new R1 is 103 negative one, zero, zero, 60. And that's supposed to tell us something later. R2 was the pivot, so that was two, three, zero, one. And then zero, zero, two, 40. R3 was unchanged because it already had the zero, so it's one, three, zeros, one, zero. And then I believe that was 80. And then the new R4 is negative 8, 0, 0, 17, 0, 3, 40, 80. So the question is, what solution can be read from this table? Now keep in mind how the makeup works here. So any column that has all zeros but one entry is now a basic variable. So that means we have x2, we have s1, we have S3, and we have Z. Now, if it has a number other than one, that's okay. That just means there's a coefficient here. 
But what this means automatically is that x1 is equal to 0 and s2 is equal to 0. So that means we essentially swapped out x2 for s2. Okay. Um, what is the rest of them? Well, as far as x2 goes, it looks like we have 3x2 is equal to 240, which means x2 is 80. Hey, look familiar? It should. Because that was, remember, that was the ratio that we were able to use for x2, right? So it looks like we have 3s1 is equal to 60, which means S1 is equal to 20. It looks like we have S3, that has a coefficient of one right here, and that looks like it's equal to 80. And that means Z, well, let's say three Z is equal to 40, 80, which means Z is equal to 1360. And that's our solution right now. So the big question is, is this optimal? And the answer, is no. So we're going to have to go through another iteration, but let's talk about why. So the reason this isn't optimal is because of this x1 right here. Remember that that bottom row corresponds to the objective function. And if there's a, co a negative value in the table, that means there's a positive value yet in the constraint function, right? So with a negative there, that means that I could still increase z by eight units per unit of x1 that I introduce. So we're gonna to have to go through this whole process again, and my suspicion is that after one more iteration, it's going to be optimal. So come on back for a new, for the next episode, and hopefully we can finish it out by then. So thanks for watching.